Okay. So I got it live again. Let's see. I'm going to recheck it over here on my laptop. I'm sorry, y'all. Let's see. It's... Okay. It's public. Okay. Should be good. Now, this is weird. I don't know. Maybe, um... I don't know. I don't know why it does that. Because I definitely don't be changing it. Okay. Just, okay. It just popped up, Tiffany. Okay. <laughs> it just popped in. Okay. All right. So, sorry, y'all, for the delay. I don't know. I got to remember to make myself a note to always check the, um, check the, um, the settings on it. Make sure Facebook hasn't done some kind of update or whatever and changed my privacy settings so people can see I'm live. Christy, hey, girl, hey. Okay. All right, y'all. So I just started the Facebook video over because it wasn't showing I was trying to change the privacy settings on this or the show. So I just ended it and started over. And we did the shimmer on the one I just deleted. So you're not going to see the shimmer up here. <laughs> All right. So let's go. Dreams got to love a good morning. Okay, y'all. So let me go ahead and bring this up. We are in Psalms chapter 37. All right, y'all. Psalm chapter 37 is Psalm of David. Levon, blessings. Okay, y'all. Don't worry about the wicked or those who do wrong or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in Yahuwah and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Excuse me. Take delight in Yahuwah. And he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to Yahuwah. Trust him and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn. And the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of Yahuwah and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. For the wicked will be destroyed. But those who trust in Yahuwah will possess the land. Soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, they will be gone. The lowly will possess the land and will live in peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the godly. They snarl at them in defiance. But Yahuwah just laughs, for he sees the day of judgment coming. The wicked draw their swords and string their bows to kill the poor and the oppressed, to slaughter those who do right. But their swords will stab their own hearts and their bows will be broken. It is better to be godly and have little than to be evil and rich. For the strength of the wicked will be shattered, but Yahuwah takes care of the godly. Day by day, Yahuwah takes care of the innocent, and they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. They will not be disgraced in hard times. Even in famine, they will have more than enough. But the wicked will die. Yahuwah's enemies are like flowers in a field. They will disappear like smoke. The wicked borrow and never repay, but the godly are generous givers. Those Yahuwah blesses will possess the land, but those he curses will die. The Lord, Yahuwah, I try to remove the Lord and put Yahuwah's name sometime I I forget and say the Lord, okay. Just in case, because a lot of people ask me, well, what version are you reading from? Because I be saying it. I'm still reading from the New Living Translation, which still has God and Lord in it. But every time I see it, I just replace it. Mom, Trina, hey, girls, hey. So just in case y'all wondering about that, trying to find a version where that is in, they do have some that has Yahuwah's name in it. But I like the NLT. Some of those other versions, they still read like the KJV. And it's like, some people's like, well, are you reading from the KJV? Just, you know, so I like the New Living Translation because it's like today's vernacular, right? And it's, it's, it's really easy to understand. Okay. Yahuwah directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall. 
for Yahuwah holds them by the hand. Once I was young, and now I am old, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. The godly always give generous loans to others, and their children are a blessing. Turn from evil and do good, and you will live in the land forever. For Yahuwah loves justice, and he will never abandon the godly. He will keep them safe forever, but the children of the wicked will die. The godly will possess the land and live there forever. The godly offer good counsel. They teach right from wrong. They have made Yahuwah's law their own, so they will never slip from his path. The wicked wait in ambush for the godly, looking for an excuse to kill them. But Yahuwah will not let the wicked succeed or let the godly be condemned when they are put on trial. Put your hope in Yahuwah. Travel steadily along his path. He will honor you by giving you the land. You will see the wicked destroyed. I have seen the wicked and ruthless people. I'm sorry. I have seen wicked and ruthless people flourishing like a tree in its native soil. But when I looked again, they were gone. Though I searched for them, I could not find them. Look at those who are honest and good. For a wonderful future awaits those who love peace. But the rebellious will be destroyed. They have no future. Yahuwah rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. Yahuwah helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. He saves them, and they find shelter in him. Psalm chapter 38, a psalm of David, asking Yahuwah to remember him. O oh, Yahuwah, don't rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your rage. Your arrows have struck deep. Your blows are crushing me. Because of your anger, my whole body is sick. My health is broken because of my sins. My guilt overwhelms me. It is a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and stink because of my foolish sins. I am bent over and racked with pain. All day long, I walk around filled with grief. A raging fever burns within me, and my health is broken. I am exhausted and completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. You know what I long for, Yah. You hear my every sigh. My heart beats wildly. My strength fails, and I am going blind. My loved ones and friends stay away, fearing my disease. Even my own family stands at a distance. Meanwhile, my enemies lay traps to kill me. Those who wish me harm make plans to ruin me. All day long they plan their treachery. But I am deaf to all their threats. I am silent before them as one who cannot speak. I choose to hear nothing, and I make no reply. For I am waiting for you, O oh Yah. You must answer me. You must answer for me, O oh you who are my God. I prayed, don't let my enemies gloat over me or rejoice at my downfall. I am on the verge of collapse, facing constant pain, but I confess my sins. I am deeply sorry for what I have done. I have many aggressive enemies. They hate me without reason. They repay me evil for good and oppose me for pursuing good. Don't abandon me, O Yah. Do not stand at a distance, my God. Come quickly to help me, O Yahuwah, my Savior. Psalm chapter 39. For Jeduthun, the choir director, a psalm of David. I said to myself, I will watch what I do and not sin in what I say. I will hold my tongue when the ungodly are around me. But as I stood there in silence, not even speaking of good things, the turmoil within me grew worse. The more I thought about it, the hotter I got, igniting a fire of words. Yahuwah, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. We are merely moving shadows, and all our busy, rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth, not knowing who will spend it. And so, Yah, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. 
Rescue me from my rebellion. Don't let fools mock me. I am silent before you. I won't say a word, for my punishment is from you. But please, stop striking me. I am exhausted by the blows from your hand. When you discipline us for our sins, you consume like a moth what is precious to us. Each of us is but a breath. Hear my prayer, O oh Yah. Listen to my cries for help. Don't ignore my tears, for I am your guest, a traveler passing through, as my ancestors were before me. Leave me alone so I can smile again before I am gone and exist no more. Psalm chapter 40, for the choir director. It's another Psalm of David. I waited patiently for Yahuwah to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in Yahuwah. Oh, the joys of those who trust in Yah, who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. Oh, Yahuwah, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. You take no delight in sacrifices or offerings. Now that you have made me listen, I finally understand. You don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. Then I said, look, I have come, as it is written about me in the scriptures. I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. I have told all your people about your justice. I have not been afraid to speak out, as you, O oh Yah, will know. I have kept... I have not kept the good news of your justice hidden in my heart. I have told everyone in the great assembly of your unfailing love and faithfulness. Yah, don't hold back your tender mercies for me. Let your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles surround me, too many to count. My sins pile up so high, I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs on my head. I have lost all courage. Please, Yah, rescue me. Come quickly, Yah, and help me. May those who try to destroy me be humiliated and put to shame. May those who take delight in my trouble be turned back in disgrace. Let them be horrified by their shame, for they said, Aha, we've got him now. But may all who search for you be filled with joy and gladness in you. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, Yahuwah is great. As for me, since I am poor and needy, let Yahuwah keep me in his thoughts. You are my helper. You are my helper and my savior. Oh my God, do not delay. Last chapter for today, Psalm chapter 41. It is for the choir director, and it is also a Psalm of David. Oh, the joys of those who are kind to the poor. Yahuwah rescues them when they are in trouble. Yahuwah protects them and keeps them alive. He gives them prosperity in the land and rescues them from their enemies. Yahuwah nurses them when they are sick and restores them to health. Oh, Yah, I pray, have mercy on me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. But my enemies say nothing but evil about me. How soon will he die and be forgotten, they ask. They visit me as if they were my friends. But all the while they gather gossip. And while they leave, I'm sorry, and when they leave, they spread it everywhere. All who hate me whisper about me, imagining the worst. He has some fatal disease, they say. He will never get out of that bed. Even my best friend, the one that I trusted completely, the one who shared my food has turned against me. Yah, have mercy on me. Make me well again so I can pay them back. I know you are pleased with me, for you have not let my enemies triumph over me. You have preserved my life because I am innocent. You have brought me into your presence forever. Praise Yahuwah, the God of Israel, who lives from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. All right, beautiful people, that is our reading for today, Psalm 37 through 41. And we're reading more than the three chapters because the book of Psalms, most of the chapters are extremely short. 
But when we get to Psalm 119, that will be the only chapters that we read for that day. All right, y'all. So, Shakespeare's Secret Messiah. We pause on page 38 at the, um, the second paragraph, the section. The Gospel's Dependency on Josephus. Dependent, the dependencies of the Gospels on Josephus' works are well known. While devout Christians might maintain that the striking parallels are a result of Jesus' supernatural ability to foresee the future, secular scholars agree that the gospel authors drew several passages directly from Josephus. The parallels are detailed, specific, extensive, sequential, highly interpretable, and cannot be traced to any earlier common source. Therefore, I am satisfied that this dependency exists in the strongest possible form. The gospel authors must have had access to a copy of Josephus' work, and they intentionally chose to make use of it. Atwill has gone beyond other scholars by discovering that the extent of subtle references to Josephus in the New Testament is much greater than has ever been recognized before. All these parallels, both the well-known overt ones as well as the newly discovered ones, point to the interpretation that the biblical Jesus foretells that his second coming as the Messiah will occur in 70 CE when the Son of Man comes to destroy the temple in fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel. In parallel passages, in Josephus, we learn that these prophecies from both Jesus and Daniel were historically fulfilled in the person of Titus playing the role of the Son of Man with his conquest of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Remember, we're still in the introduction like we will be for the next couple of days because it's 65 pages. So the introduction is an overview of the book we just read, Jesus Messiah, if you're new here and you're not quite sure. But also I want to recommend something, right? I want to recommend, as I was reading through here yesterday, the section in the Revelation that we're going to get to in a few weeks. When we get to the book, so the book of Revelation, when it breaks down every chapter, it starts at the middle of this book and it's going to go all the way to the end. But I want to recommend, I'm going to get a link for it today. I want to recommend that if you've never seen the play Hamlet, that you that you watch it. I'm going to find a link for it. I think it's Hamlet. I want to say, I want to say Romeo and Juliet too. I want to say watch that because it's going to bring up some things and so you'll be familiar with it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to go back through here and double check and see if we actually... Everybody probably already seen or at least watched one play of Romeo and Juliet. It's been redone multiple times by many different people. Um, but when you watch it, you will see because he's going to use some of those things in there. And he's going to begin to uncover some things that's going to link to the New Testament and how they did all of this. So I think you don't have to. You don't have to go watch it. But I, I think it'll be really good if you do. I'm actually going to refresh and watch it sometime in the next couple of days. I'm actually watching both of them. Right, um, because I, I some things if, if you're not familiar with the writing of Shakespeare, um, it when we get to that portion, it may just sound like a bunch of blah 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 blah. I don't know what in the world y'all talking about. I'm scrolling doing something else. Come back, <laughs> let me know when y'all get to Revelation. But I think it's really beneficial if you do, right? You don't have to do it right away, just sometime in the next couple of days, maybe the next week, if you get a chance to watch it. If not, okay well and good you know just stick with us when we get through that but it's he got there's a reason why he's using using shakespeare he's from that same line of lineage and what they're doing and they was able to link all this together so i just wanted to say that just in case i'll get the links for you all right of course this is not the messianic outcome that the jews expected not only was Titus a Roman rather than a Jew, but he slaughtered the righteous zealots and Sakari and ordinary Jews by the hundreds of thousands rather than concentrating his fury on the Romans and their Herodian collaborators. But the biblical Jesus' prophecies were completely consistent with Josephus's viewpoint, if Vespasian were divine, then his son Titus would obviously share in that divine nature. Also, the spiritual campaign of Jesus Christ, as depicted in the book of Luke, foreshadows the military campaign of Titus in Judea in a sequential series of parallels 
that at will cause the Flavian signature. This creates a Roman par <clears throat> excuse me. This creates a Roman parody of a typological mapping between Jesus Christ and Titus Flavius, indicating that the gospel authors must have wanted the sophisticated reader to understand that Titus Flavius, like Jesus Christ, is to be viewed as the fulfillment of the messianic prophecies of Hebrew scripture. When the biblical Jesus is seen in this context as a typologically camouflaged Titus Flavius, suddenly a grimly humorous aspect of the narrative emerges. The reader realizes that the Gospels are filled with witty, double entrandas and pinning, I'm sorry, and punning satire, generally at the expense of the Jewish zealots, zealots as well as Christian Gentiles who take the gospel at face value. Do me a favor. Go tell Jeremiah dad is about to leave. I seen him upstairs walking around, but he didn't think he went back in there on the game. Go let him know. Tell him, come on down here, dad about to leave. All right. I got to stay on him. Next section. Josephus' knowledge of Christianity, the Decius Mundus puzzle. While many scholars acknowledge that the gospel authors were aware of Josephus, the topic of whether Josephus knew anything about Jesus Christ or Christianity is far more controversial and has been an endless topic of debate. What is widely acknowledged is that two brief famous passages in Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews specifically mentioned the the people <laughs> look heard that dope jack come on I'm gone yeah I gotta today gonna be a fun day for him well he do good he do good that's good he gonna work with his hands he know you know what he do he'll be good when he can run them projects by himself he gonna he gonna learn he he good he just play too much still <laughs> you know who I am. I'm my daddy's son. I'm like, boy, you I'm can't. Like, first you know. of all, Lil' Reggie. Man, you can't. <laughs> you can't even read the blueprint. Yeah, can he yeah. read the blueprints? No, he can't read nothing. <laughs> do what I tell him to do. Boy, if this man come over and tell her that I got her stuff. Okay. I got the, um. Tell her you're going to use the wire. Tell her I got the wire because I, if you use a board, I can't get behind her, um, her gutters. But okay. the wire is somewhere. It's just... It's right low screen. Yeah. Screen wire, you know I saw it, yeah. Just cover it up. But if she come over and ask... Let her know that I do. I'll come over and do it today. Okay. I should be off early. So. All right. I'll call you guys. Come here. You finish your thing. All right, babe. <laughs> I love you. Love you. Bye. <laughs> love you too, babe. All right. All right. Okay, y'all. Well, Tootie, so, get the next chair right there. Now you just want to sit here on my lap. Mm -hmm. Put a chair over here. Right there. Okay. Come on, next. Next. Mom, yeah. next, are you, are you, you make this movie? Yeah, I'll make you a smoothie in a minute. Please. Let me get done with this and I'll make a smoothie. Okay. okay. Josephus's knowledge of Christianity, the Decius Mundus puzzle, and I'm just starting this over. While many scholars acknowledge that the gospel authors were aware of Josephus, the topic of whether Josephus knew anything about Jesus Christ or Christianity is far more controversial and has been an endless topic of debate. What is widely acknowledged is that two brief famous passages in Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews specifically mention the biblical Jesus. In one of these, known as the Testimonium Flavium, 18, 3, and 63 through 64. Josephus states that one Jesus, the Christ, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, but appeared alive to those that loved him after an interval of three days. This seemed to be a clear enough statement of the basic tenets of the Christian faith, but the endless debate goes on over whether Josephus really said all of these things or whether the passage or some part of it was a late interpolation by, pi by pious scribes of the early Christian era. In the other passage, Josephus briefly mentions the brother of Jesus who was called Christ whose name was James, 
20, 9, and 200. Again, this seems to indicate that Josephus was well aware of the existence of Jesus Christ, although there is some debate about what Josephus meant by Christ or whether those few words might have been a late interpolation. The vexing aspect of this, which is or should be so confounding to faithful believers, is that Josephus could have known this much about Christ and Christianity and yet have said so little more about it. During the period between 30 AD and 70 AD, the years at the heart of Josephus' historical tale were Christ's disciples not hard at work in Judea, growing their charm. What? During the period between 30 AD and 70 AD, the years at the heart of Josephus' historical tale were Christ's disciples not hard at work in Judea, growing their church, doing great miracles, and generally prom promulgating their proud and exciting novel religious faith. Oh, that was a question. Were not, supposed to be were they not? All right. How could Josephus have been aware of this and yet not dedicated at least a few chapters to giving his views of this good news? Josephus was certainly never at a loss for words in describing any other popular Jewish sect, Jewish sect of the time. Atwell argues that Josephus did indeed have an intimate knowledge of of Christian narratives and theology and that he referred to it often. However, instead of speaking plainly, Josephus wrote vicious satires of Christianity and these satires were often placed within typological parallels to passages in the New Testament or in the case of the testimony of Flavian, at will argue that it can be recognized as genuine in its entirety because it can be seen as a part of a literary trip type trip trip type sandwiched alongside two it in hold on enigmatic enig enigmatic i'm sorry y'all some words i have a hard time pronouncing bear with me enigmatic satires built on the new built on new testament things briefly stated in the central satire, a rogue named Decius Mundus pretends to be the god Anubis in order to trick a dignified lady named Paulina into having sex with her. And if y'all was here for that, y'all should remember that story very well. That was read about a couple weeks ago. The name Decius Mundus is a pun on Decius Mus, the famous Roman war hero who gave himself as a sacrifice in battle to guarantee the Roman victory in war. Mundus no, means what? world. So Decius Mundus is a sacrifice for the world. Uh, who is that right there? Me. Do me a favor. Make sure that door is locked. Make sure the screen door, the top and the bottom is locked, and um, both locks on the big door. Thank you. Paulina and her husband, Saturnius, laughably, laughably yes. agree that making love to a god would be no sin against Paulina's chastity. Josh, I just got on my mom bed. So Paulina and Mundus enjoy a night together, but then Mundus returns on the third day to boast that he is no god, much to Paulina's chagrin. In other pedimental satire, a woman named Fulvia, whose husband's name again is Saturnius, is persuaded by three men to send her wealth to the Jewish temple. But in reality, the three men spend the money for their own uses. In the first satire, Mundus is an anti-type of Jesus. In the second, the three men may represent the Roman Trinity. The two stories are, of course typologically coupled to each other as well as they both tell essentially the same tale of a dignified lady with a husband named Saturnius who is tricked by a religious swindle. The choice to use the name Paulina in the story may be a hint to the Romans, may be a hint that the Romans viewed the original St. Paul, the author of the epistles, as a feminized victim of the swindle as well. Strangely enough, 
the fact that the testimony of Flavium Triptite was a satire of Christianity was apparently understood as early as the 4th century by the Christian author Suedo Hegesippus, whose Latin paraphrase of Josephus elaborated on the satires by having Paulina and Mundus discuss the possibility of a pregnancy, thus making her into a parody of the Virgin Mary. This was pointed out by Albert A. Bell in his 1976 paper, Josephus the Satirist, that's beautiful baby, reference 26, who mentioned that a 1927 paper by C. Farr had also fingered the Josephus passage about Paulina and Mundus as a parody of the Annunciation. Bell, however, withheld his own judgment on the matter, stating, quote, the view that Josephus was a satirist has the decided has the decided disadvantage of being quite subjective. We must assume on the basis of our own reactions that the story of Paulina and Mundus appeared to Josephus as a parody of sorts of the Annunciation story that he could depend on his readers to draw the same parallel lacking even a hint of literary evidence to support it we are justifiably hesitant to accept this suggestion end quote i can only hope that bell was being ironic himself with this brief dry spoof of high bound academic caution and humorlessness especially after having titled his paper with the bold assertion of josephus's comedic aspect hedged only with a question mark. However, I note with some discouragement that Bell's argument disappeared with hardly a ripple, three obscure mentions in the English language since 1976 in the Google Scholar Citation Index. This, in spite of its obvious and even decisive relevance to the endless academic debate about the Testimonium Flavium. Next section on page 42, the problem of plausible deniability and the smoking gun fallacy. In Caesar's Messiah, Atwill argues that the Flavians were proud that they invented Christianity and that they wanted to be remembered by posterity for their accomplishment. But on the other hand, he often mentions that a particular, particularly, particularly, complex and obscure typological device was invented because a simpler means of expression would have made Flavian compl complicity too obvious. Is this a contradiction? At first glance, this seems to be a serious problem with the Flavian origins thesis. If, as Atwill claims, the Flavians created Christianity primarily for propaganda purposes, then they knew that their work needed to compete with all the other religious sects that were vying for the allegiance of Jews and Gentiles alike anywhere in the empire. For that reason, it was obviously essential that the text be as appealing and as convincing as possible. It doesn't make sense that the authors would have included anything such as a complex self-incriminating typological framework with satire overtones that could divert from that goal. In his review of Caesar's Messiah, Robert M. Price wrote, only the most obtuse reader, the most ten-eared, can possibly fail to appreciate the sublime quality of so much of the New Testament, as if Atwill's theory does not recognize this. On the contrary, the Flavian origins theory requires that the New Testament would be perceived as having just such a sublime quality in order for it to succeed in its evangelical goals. Christ continued, 
acid. Jesus is teaching at will declares that those who see spiritual meaning in his words are being played for a fool. Such a statement is only a damning self-condemnation, revealing the author's own absolute inability to appreciate what he is reading. This, again, is a misreading of Atwell's point. He is not saying that the surface-level spiritual meaning is missing from the text, but rather that it is being used as a sugar coating on a Trojan horse full of Roman ideological foot soldiers. I wonder... If Price would deny that a multitude of impoverished and enslaved Christians have indeed been played for fools by their masters, the elite. Robert Batwabu, Yahuwah is one peace and blessings. Furthermore, the Flavian intellectuals also needed to write material that would seem credible within the cultural milieu of ancient Mediterranean region. That means they needed to write material that was consistent with the pre-existing source materials, including both Zealot and Herodian documents, and consistent with the general level of historical understanding among the general public. However, this latter constraint is not as tight as it would be in a modern environment. At the time that the Gospels were written, the period of its historical settings, that is, the time of Tiberius and Pontius Pilate, was receding into the distant past, and many readers would have only a very general and highly colored understanding of the period. Furthermore, literacy was fairly rare at the time, and most of the intended audience of the Gospels would be hearing about them secondhand from the clergy. Of course, there was no printing press, so copies of any historical literature were rare and hard to come by. Thus, the Gospel authors could feel that they could indeed take some liberties with historical truth without much risk of being caught by the general public. Nevertheless, there certainly were some intellectuals who would have had a deep understanding of the historical literature, including many documents that have not survived the present time. For those readers, the Gospels would have conveyed a powerful message that the Flavians were brazen enough to blatantly falsify and invert the factual record in service of their own propaganda objectives. In light of the mission critical prime directive to avoid alerting Hoi Poli about the nature of this strange alien imperial religious conspiracy, it seems undeniable that the operational security of the project would have been enhanced if the Flavians had chosen to avoid inserting typological traces of their crime directly into New Testament texts and the works of Josephus. We need an explanation of why they chose to do so in spite of the fact that they might easily have been inconvenienced at times by the need to explain themselves to careful and suspicious readers or even threatened with failure of the project if the truth became too widely known. Contrary to Atwill's suggestion in Caesar's Messiah, I do not believe they ever intended for the crime to be discovered by the slaves and commoners, or hoi poi, who made up the vast majority of Christian believers. However, considering the level of sophistication of the vast majority of people at the time, the Roman intellectuals simply weren't concerned that the public would recognize the fraud. All they needed to do was avoid leaving any smoking guns that will overcome the level of plausible deniability in the gospel text and make the deception obvious to even the most obtuse reader. With that limit, within that limitation, they apparently considered themselves free to consider a variety of objectives within their writing. In fact, as a general rule, I believe that evidence of elite criminality and conspiracy is strewn about today by the same general standard, obvious to the sophisticated reader, but never so obvious as to represent a smoking gun that might alarm the general public. Based on the extensive monuments that the Caesars of the imperial cult constructed for themselves, their vanity may have been so great 
that we can hardly imagine it today. While they may not have cleared, I'm sorry, well, while they may not have cared what the Hoi Poi knew, they might have been especially concerned to leave a message that future royals and their intellectuals would understand and view with respect and presumably admiration. My view is that the typologi typo typology may have also been used as a teaching tool in the imperial secret service, which may have been embedded within the Roman imperial cult. The early Roman Catholic Christian church may have also been operated at that time as a mystery cult, reference 27. Perhaps the temples dedicated to the worship of Jesus and or other current emperor were run like modern Masonic lodges with the higher levels of membership and the great secrets reserved to royal and long-term functionaries of the imperial service, and that these higher levels were accompanied with appropriate accolades, prestige, and financial rewards. And I'm imagining that just as in the modern corporate and political system, exhibiting a certain level of sociopathy couldn't have done any harm to a young man's prospects. If this was the case, then Josephus was being ironical when he wrote in his book against Apion, quote, they, there have been indeed some bad men who have attempted to illuminate my history and took it to be a kind of scholastic performance for the exercise of young men, end quote, page one and 53. If this theory that the gospels were primarily used as secret documents of the Roman imperial cult and the closely related embryonic Roman Catholic church, it would also help to explain the mystery of the gospel's late appearance in the overt historical record. We argue that the gospels must have been written under the Flavians, not only because they contain so much material that is pertinent to their agenda, but also because there is little, if anything, in the gospels that would indicate any knowledge of events that transpired after the death of Domitian in 96 CE. However, the first church father to write openly of the existence of the four Gospels was Irenaeus in approximately 180 CE, reference 28. Because of this, there have been claims that the Gospels were first written at this time, falsifying Atwill's theory, reference 29. But Irenaeus clearly stated his own viewpoint that all four of the canonical Gospels existed from the earliest days of Christianity and possessed full apostolic authority. Quote, Matthew issued was a written Gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect, while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome and laying the foundations of the church. After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Luke, also the companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. Afterwards, John, the disciple of the Lord, who also had leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia against heresies three one and one end quote those who claim that Irenaeus intervened i'm sorry those who claim that Irenaeus invented the four gospels or that they were first written during his time have not explained how he could foist such a fiction on other members of the catholic church at such a late date and hope to retain any credibility it seems much more likely that there is some grain of truth in his claim that they had existed much earlier and that his true purpose in writing about the Roman Gospels was to assert their claims of superiority over the many apocryphal Gospels that were proliferating at the time. Some of these apocryphal Gospels might have been earlier Roman drafts that had, that had been superseded and others might have been similar to modern fan fiction. However, 
all of them needed to be stamped out as the Roman hierarchy had determined that the time had come to bring Christianity into a single large tent. As Irenaeus explained, quote, it is not possible that the gospels can be either more or fewer in number than they are. For since there are four zones of the world in which we live and four principal winds, while the church is scattered throughout all the world and the pillar and ground of the church is the gospel and the spirit of life, it is fitting that she should have four pillars breathing out immorality on every side and vivifying men afresh. End quote. That's three, two, and eight. Such arguments aside, the status of the four Gospels before Irenaeus remains a matter for speculation. However, considering the rapid spread of Christianity during the first and second centuries, the lack of any such documentary evidence is in itself quite surprising. From a Bayesian perspective, this increases the likelihood of the hypothesis that the Gospels were indeed maintained as secret documents of the early Roman Catholic Church. Without further ado, let's look at this lesson plan that might have been taught at the 32nd degree of the imperial cult. The lessons are presented in the order that they appear in the Gospel of Luke. Where are we at? Okay, so he about to go through them. So we might get through the first two. The first one is fishing for men. The parallels are highlighted in bold typeface, Luke 3 and 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And a voice... Hold on, y'all. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, let me go back. Luke 3 and 21, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Jesus began his ministry, Luke 5. Luke, Luke, I'm sorry. Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. All his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid from now on. You will fish for people. So they followed him. Matthew eleven twenty one. Jesus prophesied, Woe to you, Chorazin. Josephus Wars 3 and 10. Vespasian pitched his camp at the lake of Gennesaret, Jesu, and his party made a sally upon them. Vespasian thereupon sent his son to disperse them. Titus. For you know very well that I shall go into the danger first and make the first attack upon the enemy. Do not you therefore desert me, but persuade yourselves that God will be assisting to my onset. And now Titus made his own horse march first against the enemy, as did the others with a great noise after him. Jesus fled over the country while others of them ran down to the lake, and some were slain as they were getting up into the ships. The city was taken, but some rebels fled in ships. Vespasian went to the lake. A long digression follows, describing the lake. The name Gennesareth is repeated three times. Some have thought it to be a vein of the Nile because it produces the Khorasan fish as well as the lake that, as well, I'm sorry, because it produces the Khorasan fish as well as that lake does, which is near to Alexandria. Vespasian's vessels destroyed the rebel ships, leaving the rebels drowning at sea to be killed by darts or the Romans cut off either their heads or their hands. End quote. As a typological sequential parallel, this is only moderately impressive. Critics will note that every military campaign has its onset and the warriors call for his troops to have courage and his bravely leading them into battle must be a commonplace across hundreds of ancient manuscripts. The somewhat distinctive shared elements between the New Testament and Josephus's passages are a son of God, no less, sent into battle, 
the location, which is Gennesaret, yeah. and the involvement of a character named Jesus, which was, however, apparently a very common Judean name at the time, judging from the sheer number of possible distinct Jesus characters mentioned in Josephus' text. However, if we recognize that the Josephus passage contains an enigma, the situation becomes more interesting. He says, some have thought it, the Lake of Gennesareth, to be a vein of the Nile because it produces the Khorasan fish as well as that lake does which is near to Alexandria. It is obviously ridiculous that anyone would think that the Sea of Galilee or Gennesareth is a vein of the Nile. The ancients for millennia before Josephus knew their geography better than that. And there is no lake anywhere near Alexandria. It's in the Nile Delta where any body of water would be more akin to a swamp. Such absurdities should surely be a clue that Josephus's warped sense of humor is coming into play. The answer to the riddle is that the Jews are like fish and that the Hellenized Jews are found in great numbers in Alexandria just as they are in the area of Palestine near the Sea of Galilee. The Chorazin fish seem to be a pun on the name of the town Chorazin, which Jesus curses in the passage from Matthew. In Josephus' narrative, we find that Titus is slaughtering these fish by the thousands. To make the point clear, Josephus ends the story with his all-too-graphic description of the Romans killing men with darts drowning them or cutting their limbs off in their rout of the Jewish rebels at sea. This warrior's metaphor of fishing for men is well-known liter literary trope. See, for example, quote, the mighty Lestragonians came thronging from all sides. At once there rose throughout the ships a dreadful din, a light from men that were dying and from ships that were being crushed and sparing them like fish, they bore them home a loathing meal. And that's found in Odyssey chapter 10, pages 119 through 124. Also see Odyssey chapter 12, pages 245 through 255, chapter 22. I'm sorry. Chapter, yeah, chapter 22, pages 381 through 389. Ancient readers of the New Testament who learned their Homer in grammar school might have been pleased to find that the gospel authors appear to have inverted and ennobled this barbaric trope. However, in the final analysis, the joke is on the Christians since Josephus' humorous point is that the Chorace and fish in the lake are the Jewish rebels that are being fished by the Romans. The New Testament passage is tightly coupled to Josephus' enigma by this distinctive concept of fishing for men as well as the various less distinctive elements. Jesus' Jesus's spiritual gathering of his father, followers and his call for them to be fishing for men grimly foreshadow Titus's actual slaughter of the Jews occurring at the same location at Gennesareth, allegedly 40 years later. And that, my beautiful people, is where we're going to stop today. Tomorrow we're going to pick, pick it up um, with the rest of these, starting with the demons of Gadara as he continues to break it down. So let me go through here. All right, y'all. It is Wednesday, October the 27th. 2021, day 287 of years we are reading through the books of the Law and the Prophets. And of the three-year consecutive day count, day 955, we read Psalms 37 through 41. And in Shakespeare's Secret Messiah, we are still in the introduction. We read pages 38 through 49. All right, y'all. So let's go ahead and do the blessing. Hope y'all enjoyed the reading for today. Remember the blessing is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Yahuwah will kneel before us, presenting gifts, and will guard us with a hedge of protection. 
Yahuwah will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards us, bringing order, and he will provide us with love, sustenance, and friendship. Yahuwah will lift up his wholeness of being and look upon us, and he will set in place all we need to be whole and complete. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. All right, beautiful people. That is it. Bella? Yeah. Come on. So we're going to end this, and I will um, remember to put the links to those uh, two plays up there. I know they got different versions of the plays where different people did it, um, but I'll put it in there. If you like one version better than the other, just kind of refresh yourself on it. Ready, so when Mom. we get to that part, you Mom. know, you can kind of keep up. Yes. Ready. Yes, I'm ready. All right, beautiful people. That's it. I love y'all. I see y'all bright and early in the morning, 7.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll do this. What? Peace. Peace. <laughs> All right, Gil. Shalom, shalom. Hallelujah. Oh. All right, beautiful people. She about to end it. See y'all in the morning. Peace. Peace. Go ahead and end it.